man, this is Deion Dawkins, man, and you're listening to The Scoop on OwlScoop.com. You already should know. Seven episode nineteen. I'm John Carlo, joined by Sam Cohn, Dante Colinelli, and in making his appearance on the scoop, the Prince of East Baltimore, Javon. Ah, Evans. that's a good one. That, that is a, one. quite Javon, the title. It's quite the title, but I have I have given you this title. What say you, Javon? What do you say to that title? It's, it's lovely to have you with us. What's going on? Uh, 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 thanks for having me on. Uh, that title right there, I think there might be some people who uh, want to debate me on that. But uh, you know what? If you want to bestow it upon me, I will not argue. Uh, and apparently, we're joined by Turd Ferguson today. <laughs> so, uh, that's us just having a meltdown on Zoom and changing each other's names. Sam, feel free to change your name back. <laughs> we like to have fun on the scoop sometimes. We're uh. Ask Javon how he's doing, but in reality, we've all spent the last several hours together since around 9.15 this morning uh, recording another episode of The Scoop because we want to answer more of your mailbag questions, get your reaction, get our own reactions here to Stan Drayton's introductory press conference, which took place at 9.30 this morning over in the Fox Kiddest Room of Leah Corps Center. So again, uh, unless you've been living under a rock, you know that Stan Drayton has replaced Rod Carey as Temple's new head coach comes to Temple uh, from Texas, where he had been uh, the running backs coach there, uh, has a pretty loaded resume, uh, uh, associate head coach and run game coordinator under Tom Herman and Steve Sarkeesian, uh, coach B. John Robinson, he's coached, as we know, a, a lot of prominent backs during his career, Brian Westbrook, Ezekiel Elliott, Carlos Hyde. Uh, so he spoke today, the Temple kind of did the standard thing it normally does, uh, in this case, new president Jason Wingard spoke, Arthur Johnson spoke, uh, and then uh, Stan did about eight to 10 minutes of uh, Q&A with reporters. And then there was a breakout session with him, breakout session with Arthur Johnson. We're going to do uh, you know, about four, play, maybe three or four clips for you, react to them, plenty of mailbag questions to get to. But I'll send it around the horn here. Dante, is uh, he's home, not with us here in Philly, uh, spending time with family in uh, where, where in in Florida, are you just outside of Miami? Yeah, just outside of Miami. It's called Hollywood, Florida, uh, yeah, which Hollywood is where Dante. the yes, which is where the Hollywood Dante name originated from. So I was not there today. I was I was listening on YouTube uh, and following you guys all on Twitter as I was sitting on my patio in beautiful eighty degree weather. So I'm not I'm not too butthurt about it, but you you're know. wearing uh, you're wearing some sort of Dolphins gear. You look like a quality control coach right now. This is this is literally the uh, the one that they wear on the sidelines. So yes, I, I am go. dressed like a quality control coach. Uh, Stan Drayton, if you're listening, my my line is open. Please drop me a line if you want me to be your quality control coach. I, I already have the gear clearly. <laughs> uh, we'll we'll send this around the horn. Like I said, uh, initial reactions on the on the press conference uh, again. He's got a long rebuild ahead of him. Press conferences don't win games, but I, I thought he handled himself pretty well today. Dante, I'll start with you down in Florida, and then we'll work our way back up the East Coast, directly back here to, to North Philadelphia, where Sam, Javon, and I are. What'd you think? Yeah, I, I was impressed. I, I think, again, like, um, I think I tweeted this out, like, winning press conferences doesn't really matter. It's not going to win you any football games, but... If you're a Temple fan, I think you listen to that press conference, and I, I think you heard everything that you'd want to hear a new head coach say coming off of what we, you know, what they just had with Rod Carey, right? He was asked about recruiting. We're going to recruit local. He was asked about his staff. I'm going to hire guys with local ties. He talked about bringing back the Temple tough mentality. He talked about, you know, welcoming former players back with open arms and different things like that. You know, we had a lot of questions in the mailbag yesterday's show about you know is there going to be pushback from former players because a lot of them wanted Fran Brown Drayton comes out right in front of him and says you have an open door here I want you to come back and help me work with you know the players already on the roster um, I, I think you know he talked about his genuine connection to the city of Philadelphia I know we kind of joked about it before about hey you know he hasn't coached here in 20 years but it seems like you know he really does like it here and he's got a genuine connection here and he feels like he can connect with the kids that are here and in these areas that he wants to recruit so 
I think if you're a Temple fan, he said all the right things. Now, it's easy to say all the right things. We'll see what his staff actually looks like. We'll see what his recruiting, you know, what guys he decides to bring in, whether that's the transfer portal or, you know, uh, bringing in some more high school kids who didn't sign their letters of intent yesterday. But I, I think if you're a Temple fan, this is what you want to hear. This is the direction that I think a lot of people wanted the program to go into. We'll see if he follows through with it, though. Sam? Yeah, holistically, I don't think I you can say it much better than Dante just did that he said everything that if you're a Temple fan, you want to hear. Um, I thought he had strong command of the room. I thought he was very poised, confident. I thought he was very well spoken. But as Dante tweeted and as he said, that doesn't win football games and winning. I, I think Dante, I think you worded it like winning a presser means absolutely nothing, which is true. Um, but I, again, he said all the right things. I think the, the two things that stuck out in my head were the first being the second he got up to the podium, the first people he addressed, the first thing he said was to the small group of, you know, five or six players standing in the back corner of the room. He looked them dead in the eyes and talked to them first before referencing anyone else in the room. I thought that was uh, at least noteworthy. I think uh, he's only met with them once or twice and we talked to a couple of them after, but to be able to kind of just have that connection and build that connection show right off the bat that connection is important definitely means something um and then the other thing i think that was one of my other bigger takeaways especially coming off the carry era and carry always used to have the always used to say you know we live in this new world of college football where it's all about the transfer portal we're living in the world of the transfer portal we're dealing with the transfer portal guys are going to leave we're going to bring guys in um stan drayton seems very adamant that yeah, that's the case, but he wants to build a team through recruits that are going to stick around for the long haul. Uh, again, he's just like, those are words. And on today, on December 16th, that means very little. It's what he does in the next couple of months, what this February signing period looks like, you know, what, what this 2022 recruiting class looks like and what over the next two years Temple football looks like. But that was the other bigger takeaway I had was that he seems very adamant on the culture from the aspect of like, you can't build a culture from the transfer portal. You build a culture by bringing in recruits that stick around for a while. Vaughn, what do you think? Uh, number one, Hollywood Dante is a way better moniker than Hollywood Brown. Um, number two, <laughs> wow. I, I think you look, at, <laughs> you look at the players who were there today, and I think it's safe to say the two best players on Temple's roster Right now, at least in my opinion, Cameron Ruiz and Adam Klein. You want those guys as your foundation pieces. They were there, and it looked like Drayton's already starting to establish a connection with them. I think that was the highlight of the day. Number two, I like the freedom that Arthur Johnson is going to give him as far as filling out the coaching staff. It's completely up to Drayton. Uh, there are guys on the staff. We've talked about this, uh, you know, that I would like to see retained like a Preston Brown, a Gabe Infante, but I like how Drayton ties to the area, coached some big time ball in the Big Ten and in the Big 12 at Ohio State and, and Texas respective, uh, respectively. So like I said, all the right things were said in this press conference, a lot of highlights, couldn't find anything negative, but I think all three of you said it so far, press conferences don't win football games. What you do on Saturday, Thursday, Friday, if you're in the Mac Tuesday is what really is what really counts. So we'll see September 3rd, 2022 against Mike Elko and the Blue Devils, what this program looks like. But uh, fans are going to have to be patient. And it looks like Drayton is, like Sam said, excited to build a culture from the ground up. And I'm glad that he's going back to that Temple Tough culture. He's embracing the Matt Rule and Jeff Collins era and, you know, bringing former players back it seemed like the carry regime kind of got away from that so i'm glad to see that returning uh to north broad javon referencing some action some tuesday night games some thursday night games the craziness of the mac um yeah i thought he i thought he did really well today and again obviously we know that that press conferences don't win games but for a program that had a head coach, had that head coach leave 18 days later, Manny Diaz, they pivot to Rod Carey. Year one, it works out. Year two, it definitely doesn't work out. Year three, it was atrocious. I think that stuff does matter. He has a um, he has a locker room to manage, a program to manage, a, a locker room to win over. And um, I, I do think if you could go down a checklist, as you guys have said, like, did he hit on this, 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 and this? I, I thought he did you know, pretty well today. And I don't think any of it, again, literally the first time I met, Stan Drayton was today, so I can't say I know the guy, but it seemed genuine. It did not seem contrived. 
uh, thought he did pretty well. Uh, obviously, the, the next critical piece will be how he uh, he builds out his staff. So, um, and we got a lot to get to today. I want to start playing some some clips here for for you guys and and, and react to them. And we've got some mailbag questions to get to as well. Uh, the first clip that we're going to play for you here and a lot of the audio that we're going to play for you in the next several minutes is stuff from his breakout session that he did so what temple typically does it's it's 10 minutes from the president or a few minutes from the president then introducing the athletic director the athletic director speaks then the new coach in this case obviously stan drayton speaks uh does some introductory remarks then he does an intro q a with some reporters in the room then there's a breakout session so stan did a breakout session. Arthur Johnson did a breakout session. A lot of this audio was from the breakout session that, that a lot of you may not have seen. Uh, you don't get access to that online on the university's uh, athletics website. So uh, gave us a lot of his time, was great. Uh, the first clip that we're going to play here is him talking more. I asked him to elaborate on, you know, th that connection with bringing former players back, because as you guys alluded to, I mean, it's, it's important for for any program. I think some of the, the blue bloods out there can, I don't want to say take it for granted, but you know, if you're Alabama, if you're Penn state, sure, you can mess up that, that legacy and that culture, but it's, it's some of it, you know, runs itself at temple Javon, as you said, at, at least whether that perception was fair or unfair, the perception was that temple had gotten away from that. And you see that that doesn't work. So, um, and again, Several of the former players did want Fran Brown. P.J. Walker was voicing his support for him. Sean Bradley, who plays for the Eagles, was voicing his support for him. And, and, you know, nobody really asked about Fran Brown today. I wouldn't have expected Arthur Johnson to talk about who the finalists were, but I think we can reasonably deduce that, that Fran was in it up until the end. Uh, so it is going to be important for several reasons for, for Drayton to reach out. So this was, you know, I asked him to elaborate a little bit more on, you know, what that means. What's this going to look like? Uh, in terms of bringing back former players and that open door policy. And here was Stan Drayton's response to that. Well, you have to make this place available to them. You know, they, they have to feel like they're a part of this, right? They left something when they, when they played here. You know, they left a legacy. You know, just three years ago, this team won eight games. You know what I mean? And to not have them around our players at a time where we are in an adverse situation makes absolutely no sense to me. You know, if there's anybody that can pass on what Temple's all about, it's those guys. Right, and they need to be around our guys, right? When it's slipping, the mindset is slipping away from that. So um, this is their team. They were, this is their team before it was my team. And I want them to know that it will always be their team. And I, they're always gonna be heard from me, you know? So no, I think they're uh, absolutely necessary uh, to be around our football players as we, as we continue to raise these young men. And I think they're absolutely necessary uh, to be an asset for our young men when it's time to transition into real life. All right. So as you can hear there, you know, again, I'll, I thought a pretty confident answer, some good stuff, you know, with him saying, if there's anybody that can pass along what Temple was all about, it's, it's these guys, uh, they can help them through some of this adversity. Uh, so, you know, I thought he nailed that answer and I, you know, It'll be interesting to see how some of the former players warm up to him. But again, the guy's resume speaks for itself. Um, asked him to talk to you about, you know, a, a lot of people, I'm sure, maybe us included, are going to try to reach out to Brian Westbrook, the former uh, Villanova running back and, of course, the longtime Eagles running back and uh, had, a, had a short stint with the Niners near the end of his career. Uh, as you know by now, Drayton did coach and recruit, recruited Brian Westbrook to Villanova. And uh, Brian Westbrook, I, I could be wrong on this. I think that he probably could have ended up at a place like Florida had he not gotten hurt at the Matha. And, uh, you know, Drayton and Villanova stayed on him. And you'll hear a great anecdote here in a second where um, he really vouched for him. And Andy Talley, the longtime Villanova coach, said, are you ready to, like, pretty much stake your reputation and your job on this? And uh, Brian Westbrook, if you follow him on social media, has been very supportive of Stan Drayton. And uh, I asked him, I said, hey, a lot of people in this area know, are now becoming familiar with the fact that you recruited B. West to Villanova. He's beloved here in the city because of his time with the Eagles. Can you retell, can you retell that story? And so here's Stan Drayton talking about, uh, about the Brian Westbrook piece. Yeah, so he fell through the cracks. That's the one example of a guy who fell through the cracks. Uh, he got hurt his senior year, didn't have a whole lot of film. Uh, but it was a process of evaluation, and that's where coaches make the mistake. You know, just because a kid is hurt doesn't mean you turn the film off. 
<laughs> you have to evaluate talent. And in this area, you know, you have to really take the time of evaluation. You ask questions. It was the coach that was telling me at the Matha Catholic, uh, Bill McGregor at the time, telling me, that, hey, I, this kid is hurt, but he is a real deal football player. And trusting that communication from a head coach to a positional coach recruiting a kid. I mean, it's all about the connection, trusting uh, the people who are all involved in a kid's life. So that's what it was for Brian Westbrook. You know, it was a gathering of information. It was an evaluation process. And boy, were we right on that one. <laughs> we were extremely right on that one. So it was, is, been, is it, I mean, just follow up on that one. Is yeah. It, is it true you saw him dunk and call tally? Wow, you, you guys did your homework. Yeah, so, yeah, he was hurt, and the coach was telling me he pulled a muscle from his hip. I said, well, let me go watch him play basketball, okay? So I show up to a basketball game, and he literally looks at me, and I kind of give him the, I'm here. <laughs> and uh, he takes the ball and, boom, just dunks it. And I said, well, hey. Ain't nothing wrong with that hip to me, you know, so I did. I, I called Andy Talley in that moment. I said, this is the guy I want. Andy Talley challenged me on that. He said, he's hurt. Are you sure? Will you, are you, and I'll never forget this. Are you willing to put your job on the table for Brian Westbrook? And I'm like, man, this thing got really deep real quick here. But yes, I am. You know, and it was the first time I stepped out on faith like that as a coach. And boy, he, again, he, he was a pleasure to coach and he made me right. He made me right. Adante, you, did, you didn't get to, you weren't around for that one. I think Sam and Javon, you were around. I got, you know, what, what did you think of his, of him talking about the Westbrook thing and particularly Andy Talley saying to him, like, yeah, are you ready to, to stake your job on this? I just thought that was a cool piece of it. I'd never heard, I've heard Westbrook talk about him. Uh, and I, well, I've, written uh excuse me read what he's written about him but what did what did you think about that his answer there I thought it was a pretty cool anecdote Javon and I were not there for that portion of Stan Drayton's breakout session Javon and I were talking to Arthur Johnson so I would turn that question back on you and say what were your impressions of the Brian I Westbrook sworn story I saw you lurking over my shoulder I, I uh you were no there. we were a couple minutes uh late to that because we were talking to Arthur Be Johnson better. run faster <laughs> <laughs> wear, wear better shoes <laughs> ask quicker question javon <laughs> had to change his shoes after maybe if he was wearing more comfortable shoes yeah can we talk we would have been that? able to get over we, maybe we leave, we leave the lord leo core center javon's wearing just like these very nice calvin klein shoes dressed very well and i'm like let's let's go over to the bagel hut i'm hungry it's on me let's go get some food and javon's like hold on i gotta change i gotta change into my sneakers here they just changes out of his flawlessly changes out of his out of his Calvin Klein dress shoes and puts on some new balances, but it's been, he's been doing a bang up job all day. It's gotta be the shoes, right? Hey, like I told you, the shoes were for looks, not comfort. Okay. That $85 was to look good, not to feel good. So you're more well, well, okay. Well, all right. So they were to look oh, no. good <laughs> and feel good emotionally, but not physically feel good. Like they have this weird quality to them where like the left shoe rubs my left ankle the wrong way and it just gets annoying <laughs> so yeah these new balances had to come out i put the shoes on this morning so i was thinking about sneakers uh blue jeans and the polo shirts like you know what no i came underdressed the last time i'll put on something appropriate this time it's like but these <laughs> shoes are going in my bag because they're getting changed out of as soon as this thing is over now it's a cobbler show. it's a cobbler podcast cobbling shoes making shoes a shoemaker podcast <laughs> yes there's anyway, nothing I, that we can't talk about here that's right Thought you were I about think, to say something i think i'm the most underdressed reporter at every temple event ever like i i consistently show up in like very generic khaki shoes and a sweatshirt i'm terrible it's you've not terrible how, you've seen how some other sports writers dress right Yes, but I, I'm just so saying don't I think be too I'm, hard on I'm consistently the most underdressed Temple reporter for the past four years. That's all I'm saying. And I'm here to award that maybe. I don't know. Not anyway. Really. All right. John Drayton, think, Brian Westbrook. What did you think of the Brian Westbrook? Uh, no, I thought, you know, again, like I felt like I had to ask about it. Again, I'm I'm sure that, that Westbrook might do a few radio hits here and there and 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 talk about him, but um it kind of, you know, it, I mean He's raved about him. Ezekiel Elliott's raved about him. But I thought the, you know, the the anecdote there where he talks about um, going down to see him at the Matha, and you know, in addition to him uh, being hurt, you know, he talked about the the additional injury he had, the hip injury, 
and I like that. I didn't know the the basketball story where he goes up and dunks and he calls Tally and, and Tally says, you own the stake your reputation on this. And that is, I mean, that's, you know, you, you guys have probably heard this before, but when it comes time to uh, coaches putting together a signing class, a lot of times they're in like a meeting room and saying, okay, we're going to watch film of this guy. And, you know, it's a figure of speech, but they'll say sometimes I, I got to stand on the table for this guy. So we got to sign this guy. We got to take this guy. And he called them and said, yeah, we need to take Brian Westbrook. And obviously he was, a, you know, one of the better Eagles of all time. And, uh, but a cool anecdote to show you that, you know, obviously when you're recruiting in an FCS program, like program like Villanova, even though it's a good one, you do have to, to go after guys like that. And so I think it shows you that, you know, he will, again, this was more than 20 years ago. I understand that, but you, you do have to go after guys. And if they say, okay, you, you look into it, you talk to the doctors, you talk to people at the school, Hey, can you come back from this injury? If he can, and programs X, Y, and Z have backed off of a kid, you know, he has that as a basis to say, Hey, this has worked out for me before and looking at a kid like that. So I thought that the basketball piece of it was pretty cool. And Al Golden used to talk about stuff like that. Other coaches have said, Hey, I, I watched this kid play lacrosse. I like the way he moved. I, I saw him play uh, basketball. I like the way he moved there, or ran track or whatever. So I just thought that additional piece of it was a cool anecdote. Yeah. I, I mean, I wasn't there for that part of uh, Drayton's breakout session, but I did a little bit later. He had taught when talking about recruiting and kind of recruiting the area and who to recruit and how to recruit and all that good jazz. He had said something along the lines of like, he's looking at these people as these, you know, student athletes as these kids, whatever, as holistic athletes. He had mentioned like, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to look at these kids as wrestlers, as basketball players. Like that's not new. That's not a, that's not a left in the past thing. It's not a new thing to him. Like that's something that he feels strongly about doing of when you recruit kids to kind of recruit them holistically as, you know, see them beyond just football skill to, can you, uh, can you build them into great football players based on other athletic skills? You mentioned wrestling. Javon Fair, former Temple offensive lineman, was actually on the search committee, uh, was a good football player out in, uh, out in Ohio, was also a good wrestler. So, so more you know. As, as someone play. who does a lot, of, a lot of scouting, I can tell you re- the wrestling to NFL lineman pipeline is incredibly good. Yeah. Um, yeah, you want linemen who are good wrestlers. And then, like, obviously you have the basketball and track ones, right? So, like, it's, it's good to hear that, you know, Drayton talk about that stuff. It's – it's modern thinking of recruiting, and clearly it's been something, like Sam said, that he's had for a while. Yeah, Dante. You, 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 Dante. <laughs> yeah, Dante, no, you talk about, like, the next level, like, you see t- more and more tight ends now that were former basketball players. So I thought that part, like, yeah, I want someone who is a solid post scorer to be my tight end because I know he can get me out of a squeeze on third and short and go up and grab one for me. There, were, there was Tony Gonzalez, the former basketball player, Jimmy Green. Draymond, Draymond Green was the other way. He played tight end, but mm-hmm. ended up in the NBA. I think yeah. Gronk played tight, uh, played basketball too. Antonio Gates did. Yeah, Gates yeah, for sure. State. Yeah, uh, his Rico kid is Baylor. at Michigan State now, which made me feel very old. Yeah, he committed to Michigan State. I told yesterday. you this before. I don't want to hear any of you guys talk about. It made me feel old, John. I'm sorry. It did. It really whole did. Whole lives, whole lives are ahead of you. I will not allow you to speak of of aging. You're all young. I won't have it. Now you see where I'm coming from with the coffee part. You don't want to hear us talk about how old we sound. And yes, because we are as young as you say we are, people our age should not need coffee to function. Javon, you're a boomer. We're going to move on. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I wear that cat proudly. But although, Javon, what did you have to drink earlier today? Now, I did have an iced coffee to appease whoa, you and Sam. Whoa, whoa, come on now. Hey, no, no, Dante, let, me tell you, let me tell you my thought process. We were at Lee Corridors, went to the presser. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to be around these guys for a good portion of the day. Let me make them happy. And Aww. just go ahead and order a nice coffee. John, I'm John. The selfless Javon, gesture. <laughs> Javon, just your presence makes me happy. You don't need to get coffee to, to make Oh, this. that warms my heart. <laughs> Likewise, Sam. Um. Uh, Another piece that we want to get into here, and again, we're trying to like tick off like some of the the, the big questions that you guys might have and, and, and hearing about some of these things. And of course, we'll get to the mailbag in a little bit. Uh, of course, his staff, who's going to be on his staff is a, is a big thing. Uh, you know, he didn't name any names today. And again, that's fairly normal. Every once in a while, sometimes if a head coach is coming from one place to another, he might say, hey, I, I've got my strength guy with me. These guys are coming with me. But 
Uh, I think it's a little bit more intriguing this time around because Drayton is coming from Texas and he's not a current head coach or coming as the head coach from Texas. Uh, so he's going to have to build out his staff. Um, he talked a little bit more about that. And, uh, you know, I, again, we have to see who he hires. But um, if you're listening to this answer where he talks about, um, he says, and you'll hear this clip in a second, where he starts off by saying there are former or former coaches that have been here before that are intriguing to me. I think if you're a Temple fan, that should that should have your ears ringing a little bit. And again, we'll, we'll see who Stan Drayton brings in. But again, to me, that sounds like an emotionally intelligent guy who says on the most basic level, I do in part need to surround myself with some guys who know what works here and, and know how to win here. So we'll play this clip for you uh, here. And uh, again, talking about who could potentially be on a staff or the makeup of staff and what it could look like. Yeah, there are former there are former coaches that have been here before that are intriguing to me and they love this place and they're good developers, good recruiters. Um, um, but I'm going to, you know, the level of interest that I'm getting right now is primarily coaches who are home based out of this area. All right. So it's a process that I'm going to go through. Uh, I am going to put the best man, best coach in front of these kids, though. I want that to be fully understood. My wish list is to have everyone tied into this area. I really feel that I can do that. But if I can't, all right, I am going to find the best developer, best man uh, to fit these young men. All right, so again, you know, him saying my wish list is to have everyone tied into this area. I really feel that I can do that. Uh, you know, again, I think like, you know, he, he left himself a little bit of wiggle room where he said, I'm going to find the best developer of men uh, to fit this team and fit this program. Just like when Arthur Johnson said, well, I look at some people who have ties to Temple. Yes. Will that be the only factor? No. And, you know, of course he brought in a guy who hasn't coached in Philly in more than 20 years, but again, I thought pretty, pretty smart answer. Right. I liked it because he, he also followed that up with, you know, like if I can't get everyone in the area, you know, I'll just go ahead and get the next best guy. So I think having that balance, and it seems like that's what this new, you know, regime of Temple Athletics under Arthur Johnson is going to be. Like, let's focus on this area first, and then we'll go get the next, the next best person for the job. And, you know, that's even – they have Temple ties if they don't if they're just from the area and then if they're not, then it's just like, who's the next best person for the job. I think for a school like this, that is the blueprint you need to follow. If you're not, you know, big time power five, I think you are better off focusing with people with ties to your institution. Yeah. Drayton made it sound like he's pretty in on the whole, both recruiting trail and hiring a staff on the area you know, being better instant, what's the word, like being better and kind of ingrained in the area uh, and hiring a staff of people that have more knowledge of the area. Obviously, I mean, yes, he's going to say that. I'm sure he believes it too. I'm genuinely curious how much he, if at all, is kind of plugged into the Temple fan base being very like, well, this guy hasn't been here in a long time. If he is saying that because he knows that if he's saying that because he knows it's true and it's actually what he wants to do, or if like, what kind of like what the gauge of that is. Um, that's not a question. Will any of us will be able to answer, but uh, I'm just something I'm curious about. I kind of viewed it as like, it almost felt like a knee jerk reaction to like, you know, a lot of times when you see programs move on, right. That they try to hire the next coach is like the complete opposite of the guy that they just fired. Right. Rod came in and brought everyone from Northern Illinois with him. Stan comes in and the first thing he says about his staff is, well, I'm going to get guys who are here, right? It almost feels like that knee jerk reaction. I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing, but that, that's what it, that's what it read like to me. Uh, when that was the first question that was posed to him in the Q and a, and the first thing he was immediately like, I'm going to bring in local people. And I don't think like, I think it's a smart thing. Like Javon said, you should want those ties to this area. It makes recruiting a little bit easier for you. So if, hypothetically, Drayton brings in an entire staff of Philly ingrained coaches. Is that too much of an overcorrection? If it's just I, his entire staff is all Philly guys, is that too I much would, of an overcorrection? I would argue yes. I don't yeah. know how popular of an opinion. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't think he'll do it. But yeah, I would. I would argue that's a, a an overcorrection too much. I would honestly. 
I'd like to see him bring in a couple people from Texas, if I'm being completely honest. Yes. Um, that's a program that, I mean, I like to joke about the fact that they say they're back all the time, but like, you know, they, they do win some games in the, in the big 12. I'd like to see him bring some people from Texas. I think temple could use a little bit of that power five flair, frankly. Um, but I, I think it would be an overcorrection, Sam. I really do. I think the only way we'll know, we would know in that hypothetical situation, if it was an overcorrection would be the success of the team. Right. And I think, uh, you know, I know I crap on the pro Philadelphia sports fans. I think, uh, you know, a guy who does that for the collegiate aspect of it would be able to just go on a whole tirade of, you see, you need guys from the outside and all that. So, I mean, that would be a big risk to take if he went purely Philadelphia. But he does seem like the, like not to crap, not to be the guy who craps on the former regime now that they're gone and never said it to their face, even though, you know, I think we know I'm the guy who wouldn't have a problem sharing some concern with the former regime. But like, mm-hmm. Stan Drayton seems like the anti-Rod Carey oh. at this point. Like, he is the antithesis. And I, I wouldn't say he threw any subtle shots at Rod in the presser today because that just was not the case. But, like, he just seemed like everything he said was, okay, what is the opposite of what the last guy would say? Not that that was his thought process, but that's just all his answers were the antithesis of Rod Carey. Yeah, and again, it, it's interesting, like I said before, he comes in as an assistant and not a, a sitting head coach who could say, hey, I'm bringing, you know, 75% of my staff with me. And, it, you know, the the undercurrent at the time, especially after Manny Diaz left after 18 days, was like, oh, my gosh, we were embarrassed here at Temple. We need to bring in somebody who's a current head coach who wants to stay for a while. And, you know, maybe – they find a different version of Rod Carey and it works, but it obviously didn't work this time around. So now um, the way Stan Drayton built his staff is going to be more intriguing, but it could prevent a lot of like cronyism where you just say, I'm not going to bring, you know, my, my, my existing OC and DC, and I'm going to bring five or six guys with me as analysts and kind of slowly blend them in and slowly push out guys like Ed Foley and Adam DeMichael, although those guys did leave on their own accord, but you know, when they get taken off the field, it is what it is. So again, we'll have to see how it plays out, but if you're a fan, um, and honestly, even if, uh, the other thing we should touch on too, is not only if you're a Temple fan, but if you were a current high school coach in this tri-state area or in this recruiting footprint, I think you, if you're like dialed in and you're listening to that press conference, you probably like hearing that because we know how local coaches are. They want everything and more they want you to offer their kids early now if they have a chance to you know if you're the coach at Archbishop Wood or if you're the coach at at Imhotep or if you're the coach at at Newman Garetti or Roman Catholic you want to say hey Temple offer my kids offer my kids offer my kids but if they have a chance to go to to USC hey get out of Philly go see something different but you have to wrap your arms your arms around local programs here the right local programs so I think it's music to the ears of of local high school coaches as well a um, couple other clips we want to play for you here. Again, speaking to the fan base, another chord that I thought he struck. Again, they have to go out. They have to execute. They have to do these things. Can't emphasize this enough. Uh, asked him about special teams. And again, we know, uh, and I tried giving Rod Carey the benefit of the doubt when Ed Foley left. And remember thinking, okay, just because Ed Foley's leaving does not mean, you know, we have to see how Rod Carey and the staff do with special teams. We know, we know what the results were. A lot of muff kicks. Uh, a lot of poor kick coverage. They just never, ever got things going in the return game. And they certainly really didn't get things going in in going after kicks. It just did not seem to be a priority. So um, he was asked about, you know, special teams today. We talked to him about how he would approach special teams. And this is what Stan Drayton said. No, we're here to represent this city. We're on attacking style on everything we do. Everything we do should be an attacking style. We want to put pressure on our opponent on every phase of the game. So special teams is not a time to relax. It's a time to attack. So again, if you have, again, that's really like if there is one thing that's been bothering fans, among other things, about the previous regime, it's special teams, special teams, special teams. And again, it was one of those things where as long as they couldn't get out of their way, week here, week there, uh, giving up a kick, uh, not generating anything in the return game, it was going to be this lingering issue. And 
you know, and if you hear Stan Drayton say, no, we're here to represent the city, we're an attacking style and everything that we do, again, sounds like music to their ears. Again, they have to go out and do it, but thought he kind of nailed that answer as well. Um, the final clip that we're going to play for you here, and I, I thought this was kind of cool and interesting to hear too, is, you know, we didn't know, you know, he mentioned that he talked to Matt Rule last night. He mentioned also that he talked to the current team. I don't know how much of the roster, we don't know how much the roster he talked to on Zoom. Uh, I think he's meeting with the players. If he's not doing it right now or didn't do it already, uh, we're recording this around 3.15 on Thursday afternoon. Hopefully we'll get this pod up uh, a little bit later tonight for you. Um, he talked about how he had talked to the, to the players on Zoom last night. And, you know, he was asked, you know, how did it go? And he said, you know, probably a better question for them. But you'll hear an interesting piece in this audio here. He was, I think he was trying to be gracious and talking about what he wants from this team, talking about greatness and having that mentality. Um, but he was pretty honest with what he saw and uh, what he saw uh, of the film that he's watched. And here's what he talked about, a part of what he talked about when he was asked about that Zoom call. Probably a better question for them. You know, for me, it was uh, uh, an opportunity to let them know where we're moving to, where we're going. Uh, it was a moment where I, I kept it real with them. You know, the little bit of film that I did saw, I saw some quits show up, all right? And uh, we talked about what greatness is. Greatness has no quit in it at all. And uh, that showed up and uh, that bothers me. However, if as a football team, if we can face that as a reality, accept it for what it is, then I know we can move forward. And that's the sense that I got from the players on that Zoom meeting, that they were accepting of that, didn't like it, all right, but really ready to move forward now. And we can just kind of build off of that momentum, we'll be just fine. So what did you guys think of this, where he's talking about um, having no quit and he said, you know, I, to be honest with you, I want to keep it real with these guys. And I, I saw a little bit of quit in them. Now, are we surprised by that? No, we're not coaches, but we saw it. You know, I, I, I thought that maybe we talked about this earlier in the season that, you know, after they beat Memphis, you know, we don't want to overemphasize that win, but homecoming win, they come back from 17 down. Okay. Maybe they're starting to turn things around and then they never won again. And, you know, unless we're in that locker room, we don't know who's quitting. We don't know how they're reacting, but we see what we see on the field and we can see it. Stan Drayton certainly sees it. And he, you know, told us earlier today that, Hey, I saw a little bit of this on film. I want to eradicate this. And, but, you know, I never want to say that it's understandable the players quit, but it kind of shows you what the disconnect was like there. But what do you guys think about his, his, his you know, level of, of being candid there? I thought that was pretty refreshing to hear. Yeah, I thought it was really important that he said that and he was able to tell us about that. I, there's, there's an alternate universe where, you know, another coach comes in, replaces Rod Carey and says, I know what's happened the last, even just like this past season and says, we're going to put that behind us. We're going to start new. We're going to build off, you know, we're going to, we'll feel like we're going to start from the ground up. Whereas Drayton seems very understanding of like knowing how this last season went. A lot of these guys are going to be around. You can't just wipe away the past. It's important to recognize what happened mm -hmm. and to be able to, as Drayton said, build momentum off of just that one conversation. He said the players were very accepting and understanding of, of his candidness and what he was saying about, like, as you said, seeing quit in that team this past season, the players were all, you know, kind of taking accountability for it. And as Drayton said, they're excited to, uh, excited to move forward with it. All right. So let's, Oh, go ahead, Javon. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say the locker room, you, you got the sense as the season went on after that, the Cincinnati loss kind of took all of the wind out of the player sails. Mm -hmm. And for me, I understood, but I didn't understand because it's easy as somebody on the outside looking in, like, well, they were supposed to get blown out by Cincinnati. They shouldn't look too much into it. But as a player, you get a big win against Memphis on homecoming. All the fans are there. You get whooped on by Cincinnati and you don't get the fan support for the rest of the season. I mean, we were at the link those Saturdays. That place was, I mean, it was dead as a church on Super Bowl Sunday, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you're looking at it, and there's just a multitude of factors. I mean. Wow. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Pause. The, 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 Pause. That's good. Both, <laughs> if you guys could see this on, on as we're recording on Zoom, although just to, to follow safe protocol, like uh, Sam, Javon and I are all in the same general office space, mere 
25, 30, 50 feet from each other. Dante, again, of course, down in Hollywood, Florida. But as soon as Javon said that, Sam and Dante were like, hmm. I, I like, did oh, not hear a single, a single word you said after a church on Super Bowl Sunday. I was I mean, out. It, after that, it, I was like, I, it, that, I was like, okay. To think that's about it. it, who goes to church on Super Bowl Sunday? No, it's a that's a great line. I'm gonna. Yeah, you could, that. I mean, you could knock out a church service Sunday morning, go shop, get your stuff for all your buffalo chicken dip, all your little lack appetizers. You can do both, but I like the reference stuff. Yeah, but no, I'm just looking at him like you, you had <laughs> that. You had the miscommunication throughout the locker room that was highlighted by you know the Rod Carey, Justin Lynch, the Juan Mathis snap count situation. And, and then you just go to the final presser of the season where, you know, Amir Tyler is talking about players that didn't really embrace that Temple Tough mentality that his class did. And you got Will Quinko talking about some guys had to mature. And he mentioned how Ty Mason is like, a, I want to say a junior, but he tends to forget that. And it's, it's like, it was just so much going on that you can't push that to the side. If those are the right. same guys that are still around you have to correct that before you start trying to move on to any other phase of your tenure here. So, yeah, I, I'm glad Drayton is addressing that part first before he does anything else. Mm -hmm. so let's move along to uh, the mailbag here. We've got some questions uh, uh, from Twitter. We've got some from the mailbag, uh, excuse me, from the message board. So um, we will start with the mailbag. Uh, Jesus, I can talk today. We start with the message board questions first. The first one uh, comes from the screen name, a screen name E. Cheney. Question is, how surprised or happy or hype were you when Coach Drayton kind of said Temple was his dream job? Um, yeah, I, it's not our job to be happy or hype about things as reporters. We try to be as fair as possible. Uh, I don't know if I uh, had any strong feelings about him saying that it was his dream job I, again I, I think it was I think it was fairly genuine because for two reasons number one because he worked in this area before and number two because and he confirmed this today Sam is trying to juggle his pen and uh just, those are just words I'm yeah. sure it is and great yeah those are just those are just things that like, yeah you know I again I'll he, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt because I think that and he did he acknowledged that he did he did interview for the job in 2012 and he's like let's you know Mike Jensen said what year was that he's like uh Matt Rule got the job let's put it that way he won the job so uh I think this area does mean something to him but I didn't see it as a him trying to you know be disingenuous and I didn't also no. see it as him trying to set like really uh uh, you know, get people to choke up over it. I thought it was like, just a is what it is comment. Like, yeah, it's, I I wanted a coaching job and this place means a lot to me. So it didn't move the yeah, needle for either way. He also said in, in our little breakout session, he was like, I just want to be a head coach, whether that was division three, two, one, whatever. I just really want to be a head coach. So, and, you know, there's again, an alternate world where he finds a job at a D3 school and is very happy just to be a head coach. And he tells them the same thing. I think he's very excited to be in Philly. I think he's very excited to be Temple's head coach. But just to look at the surface level of him saying, you know, it was a dream job doesn't make me think anything different than, than what I thought before. Here's the way I took it. I took it as I think Stan Drayton has always thought that he could win and relate to kids here. That's the way that I took it, right? Like maybe like Temple specifically was not always his dream job. Like I found it hard to believe that, you know, in 2012, he's just like, I just, you know, Temple's really my place, you know, right? Like, I think he thinks that he could relate to kids here. I think that he has always liked the vibe here. He kind of talked about that when he was at, you know, he talked about, you know, I really learned about Temple when I was at Villanova and I always identified with the ruggedness as being an inner city kid from Ohio. Like he talked about that stuff. So like, I, I think he always felt like he could win here and he could do well here. But like, you know, like Sam said, right. The dream job thing. Like, I think that's just him probably exaggerating a little bit, you know what I mean? Just kind of trying to be, you know, intense for his first press conference. It doesn't really mean anything. I think the way that I took it was he felt like he was a good culture fit here and he's always felt that way. And I think that that should be exciting for Temple fans. Like John said, as reporters, we're not allowed to get excited about things. So, 
but I, I think as a Temple fan, like you make that's it sound like you. it's you make it sound like I'm scolding you guys and like locking you in a basement. Like you will <laughs> not get excited about this. I I do I do remember you giving that speech uh, in the first week of the sports writing class that I took with you almost two years ago. Now I do remember you giving that speech. So harken back know. to this. Harken back to this speech. What did I say? Oh God. Uh, well, I remember the the first chapter of the book that uh, for the class is like you're not a fan, right? It's like something like that. Like don't be yeah. a fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I remember that. See, I paid attention in class, John. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think simply put, the title of head coach was his dream. Temple as the destination was just, it's a nice place to be at. I can do something here. But I think the, the title was his dream, we're, not we're necessarily also, the job. But I think also from not the, try- Go ahead. I think from the outside looking in, I think I can relate to him, him being a Cleveland guy, me being a Baltimore guy. Like, yes, Temple is a school that is in a community that makes you, it, you feel like you're back at home, but you're not at home. So that quote of, you know, the ruggedness uh, attracting him, I definitely related to when I was choosing, you know, choosing schools. But I, I think the title was his dream. And I'm not going to say he doesn't have any, you know, emotional ties to the area. I mean, the guy got married here for Christ's sake. But, you know, I don't think Temple was his dream job, head coaching was. I think we're kind of belaboring this point, but it's <laughs> like, it, like at the end of the day, it's, it's Damn definitely- Damn all this to shut up is what he's saying. It's, it's a dream. It's pretty simple. I, I don't know. It's, a, it's his dream job. I don't want to take away any, any of his excitement. I don't want it to sound like any of us are like, well, it's not really his dream job. Right. Is it really? Like he does. He's extremely happy. I'm sure he's extremely happy to be here. He's very happy and feels very fortunate to be in this situation. To us covering him, that phrase of it being his dream job means next to nothing. It is a redemption story, though, since, you know, he lost out on it the last time. Yeah. I thought that was a beautiful answer before, and I'm sorry that Sam yelled at you and said we were belaboring the point. <laughs> well, he said we, not Javon. You looked at Javon when he said it. <laughs> I, lo- I looked at him on Zoom. You don't know where he is on my screen. I do. I do. I don't bet it anyway. <laughs> Top middle. <laughs> um, uh, next next question here uh, from the mailbag is from the screening SHU source. Um, Drayton mentioned the way he looked at Temple when he was at Penn and Villanova, admiring its ruggedness and his words and mentioning how he found it so relatable for a kid who grew up in what he called the inner cities from Cleveland. Uh, he continued to talk about getting involved in North Philadelphia while he was here. Did anyone have a chance to ask him about this in greater depth? Um, after the presser ended, I found it plausible and authentic in a way I didn't expect. Uh, and it did mean more than simply having coached in the same basic region as those other two schools. Um, I, I asked him, I don't know if this answers your question here, SHU source. I, I asked him about, you know, when I said, when you were back here in the, in the late nineties at, at Penn and then at Nova, um, I said, where did you, you know, where did you live? And he said, you know, when I was at Penn, you know, I, I lived right in West Philly. When I was at Villanova, he said, my wife and I lived in an apartment, I think he said, in, in King of Prussia, but we were constantly in the city. And then he kind of evolved that answer to say, I want to be as close to, to the campus as I can be. I want to be able, I think he said something like, I want to be able to touch this campus. I want to be as close to the school as I can be. So, you know, I, I, he talked a little bit more uh, about that. I can't say that we followed up specifically and said, you, you talked about growing up in Cleveland, gr- uh, being an inner city kid. Um, can you expand upon that more? We didn't direct the question in that way. I'd asked him to think back to his time in this area, but I think he kind of, you know, took it in, in some ways in that direction. I don't know if you guys had anything else to add to that. I think what I just said kind of somewhat answers part of that. It's just it. When you're a guy from the inner city, uh, another a school in a city with a similar culture is going to attract you and you feel like, yeah, I can be here for a good amount of time. I think that's really what attracts him to the the area so much, aside from the part that he played and coached in this part of, uh, you know, this region too. Mm-hmm. But I, I like that he actually wants to be here, you know, in the community and feel engaged because we know the North Philly community feels a little disengaged from Temple at times. So, you know, small baby steps to help repair that relationship. Uh, next question here 
is from the screen name B Devin Four. I believe B Devin Four was the was the guy last week who asked the the mailbag question about you know John Rothstein is on fire at center court. Do we do we do we help him? Do we do this? Do we do that? So this is what he was referencing here in the first part. Now that John Rothstein survived the horrific fire at midcourt, let's see Rod Carey was stuck in a Midwest tornado. I kid, I kid. Has there, has there been any feel, has there been any feel, uh, we should not joke about that, that was a very uh, sad set of circumstances there, um, so we're not trying to belittle that situation in any way, I should note. Um, has there been any feel on the returning players actually returning now? The coach, uh, coach Drayton has been hired. The number of players in the portal is not as large as initially expected. If Gabe Infante were to leave, do you think those numbers would spike? I guess Dan's first job will be to re-recruit the roster already uh, somewhat in place. Um, I don't, I think that most players on this roster, but let me say two things here. One's going to sound really harsh. One's going to sound really practical. Team went three and nine this year. Uh, I don't know. And I'm not presuming that like half the roster was going to say, Hey, if I don't like this hire, I'm going to hit the portal. There are, there are a lot of players on a three and nine team here who, if they hit the portal, I would ask them realistically, where do you think you're going? Do you want to transfer down to the FCS level? Do you want to, you want to transfer to D2? I mean, what is it that you, what is it that you want? Um, you know, so I, I don't, I never really anticipated this mass exodus. Now, obviously they lost a pretty good player in MJ Griffin. And, and I think he was waiting around to see who the hire was going to be. He felt like he waited as long as he could and up at Louisville. So we know that, you know, pretty good program, pretty good conference, thought that he could play there. I never really thought this was going to be uh, a huge issue. Um, you know, to, so to be Devin Forrest's question here, um, you know, the field returning players now that, that, that Drayton's been hired, I'm not expecting a huge exodus of players. I think that if any of the, the returning players watch this press conference, I would have to, I can't put myself in their shoes, but I, I thought he equated himself well today. Um, if Infante, if Gabe Infante were to leave, do you think those numbers would spike? I don't necessarily think so. And I think Gabe's pretty good at his job. I think he, he really embraced the recruiting coordinator role. Um, uh, I don't know that, that, you know, if, if Stan Drayton said, Gabe, respect you, but I'm going to replace you. I don't know that, you know, five or 10 of the best players on the team would say, oh my God, that's terrible. I'm, I'm getting out of here. Maybe I could be wrong, but I don't know. How do you guys feel about that one? I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I know me and Dante look at the game of football from a very X and O, you know, film breakdown standpoint. And, and I think what you said, like, not to sound like a jerk, but where the hell are these guys going to go? Three and nine team, a lot. And I mean, a lot of bad marks on film this season. Yeah. Where are you going to go? So, I mean, a mass exodus sounds, you know, ludicrous at this point and quite naive for any players that would plan or participate in such a thing. But I, I mean, I, Gabe has a good connection with the guys he recruits and a good feel for the, you know, the players around here. So it, it's a possibility that some of his guys leave if, you know, Infante isn't retained. And like I told you, I'd like to see him stay around I think he's a good recruiter and he's an asset to any staff in this city but yeah the, the stock is so low on guys and and I thought MJ Griffin would be that was the one guy I was honing in on like okay the next coach MJ Griffin has to be his first phone call like listen I've got a direction for this program we need you Amir Tyler's graduated you know you can be the main guy on the back end while Cam Ruiz shadows you know the Z or the, the X receiver you know, for each team. So, you yeah, know, the transferring part, though. No, and I mean, Stan Drayton's not the biggest fan of the transfer portal. I asked him about Dewan Mathis and he told me, like, yeah, something's, something's not clicking for him if he's teetering back and forth between the portal and the team, and that needs to be fixed. So, yeah, I mean, and Drayton's not the guy to coddle to the portal, the portal or the players entering the portal. So I wouldn't really read too much into it, I guess. I was going to say, um, you know, because I read your story, Javon, before we hopped on, and I read that quote, and I thought that was interesting because I honestly, like, Drayton strikes me as the type of guy, again, just based off that one quote, that if some kid was like, 
well, I'm on the fence. I honestly think Drake would tell him to kick rocks at this point. Like that, right. like that's the way that that quote kind of came off. Now, I don't know how realistic that is. And, you know, I'm sure he would be a measured guy who would take it, you know, case by case, blah, 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 you know, the whole spiel. But like the way that he talked about the transfer portal um, makes me feel like, you know, if a kid's on the fence or if a kid's like, yeah, you know, like, I, I'm just not feeling it. Like, I, I think Drake would be like, yeah, leave. Like, I don't care. Like, goodbye. Like, I, I think that he really is again that's harsh and and you know maybe you know, obviously he would phrase it much more eloquently than I just did but you know I, I think that he wants to build this team through recruiting he wants to build this team through guys who want to be here so if guys are on the fence I don't think Drayton's going to go out there and self-recruit his roster this year now I think the conversation changes when you roll this over to next year right and it's the guys that he's brought in and it's his guys and it's the guys that he feel like you know bought in from last season but this year I think he'll let guys walk if they want to walk. I don't know how much self-recruiting he's going to do. Now, I would advise him to have a conversation with Dewan Mathis and maybe recruit him. Obviously, Mathis has come back. He said he's coming back to North Philly, released a whole video about it. I get it. Um, he's the only quarterback on this roster, I think, can throw the ball further than 35 yards. So I would <laughs> highly recommend that you convince him to, you know, to stay on this team. Um but outside of that, Drayton strikes me as the type of guy who's going to be like, look, if you don't want to play here, don't play here. Now, that conversation changes next season. But right now, I, I think if guys are going to leave, I think Drayton will let them leave, frankly. Yeah, and Sam, not to be the, you know, Charles Barkley to your shack speaking twice before you speak once. But like it, it, Stan said, he said Reference. something of, you know, like you right now the portal is a distraction and we need to make it a brotherhood to where the portal is not even a thought. That's something to watch out for because that's, you know, about 25% naive. Like the way college football works right now, I think Rod Carey overstated how, the, how much of an impact the portal has on collegiate athletics, but it is a part of the fabric of college sports right now. Kids in our generation, they don't want to fight through adversity. Hey, let's just face it. We, we're a soft generation, okay? I don't know. How many guys like that? Oh, look, Come Sam on, Paul, dude, you are I'm such a up. boomer, man. Uh, yes, what I am. Heck? I am. And I embrace oh, it my fully. God. But I, I think it is such a part of the collegiate, you know, landscape that you can't put it to the side and you can't, you know, strive to a part where it's not even a thought. I mean, Matt Rule is one of the most likable guys in the world. He had guys who didn't like him. Uh, you know, Eli Ricks, a five-star corner, just left LSU for Alabama. That's sacrilege in the South, you know? So I think that just isn't a, a realistic goal. It's nice to say on per on paper, it's great for PR, but that's a tad bit naive. I, I think I, I do. First of all, great stuff, Javon. He is just like conducting an orchestra right now. I love it. It's bringing, bringing some fire today. I, I will say that I do think it is smart of him to say you know, we do need to build this again from the ground up, as cliche as that sounds. If he tries to go for a quick fix in the portal in his first year, you can't like, and I, I've talked to Gabe Infante about this. Like if they had more time, I don't know if Gabe will be on the next staff, but yes, you have to continue to re-recruit your roster. I agree with you, Dante. I think that, you know, in a certain sense, if he has, he'll meet with every guy on this roster, as I'm sure anybody would know. And I think the question will be like, okay, I saw some quitting you. Was it just that bad? And are you ready to, to work for a new staff? And if they say, yeah, just look, I, I let the, you know, I let just the negativity get the best of me, but I'm here to work. But if a guy's like on the fence, I agree that he might say, hey, good luck to you. I, I think we need, need to mutually part ways here. But I, I think that, that Stan Drayton will embrace the portal the way he needs to. And I'll have to re-recruit his guys like Dante said, but I, I think it's smart of him to say, we do, we do need to reaffirm a culture here. And bring in more high school guys. I don't think that, I don't think that you're going to see him bring in like nine or 10 guys for the next signing period in February. I think you'll see some more, I think you'll see more high school guys than portal guys. And I don't know how many they'll, they'll sign, but you know, I think he'll be pretty emotionally intelligent about that. I did. And Javon makes a fair point guys. Again, like the, the, 
the portals, the double-edged sword. It, that these guys should have that freedom. But I do think there are some guys who now this is what coaches were afraid of, but the slightest dose of adversity, boom, I'm, I'm too good for this. I'm out of here. Uh, and I think it is something that, that needs to be addressed. It's just that he's coming into a situation where the collapse was just so sudden between COVID and then even just looking at this year, you beat Memphis and then you don't ever win again. And they were not competitive in any of those games since then. So it's like, how bad was this? You know, if I get a kid from the portal, does he come here because he really wants to be part of something or would I rather go with a high school kid? So I think there's a little bit of truth to, to all of that. Um, next question here. Now we're starting to get to some of the ones from Twitter. Uh, this is the Twitter handle here is Tom Chump. Uh, Drayton was ID'd early as a lead candidate. In the end, it appears the two finalists were him and Fran Brown, the other obvious candidate. Why did this hire take so long from an outside perspective? It looks like they waited until tax signing day uh, class was locked to announce thoughts. He kind of talked about that, right? You know, um, the timeline. And I think he, didn't he say something like, and I'm paraphrasing here, didn't he say something like, I, I think that Arthur Johnson might've wanted to make this decision two days ago. He said something Tuesday. like that, right? Yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, so. so the only thing I'd add, well, just to jump in really quick, sure. Arthur said to Javon and I in a kind of a breakout session, I mean, yeah, Stan mentioned like the, this was want to get this wrapped up in a couple of days. Thursday was going to be the day they wanted to have the presser. Arthur said uh, on the note of like timeline around signing day, Arthur Johnson kind of, you know, it didn't really make that much of a difference. If we give it to him four days before sign day, it's not like that's enough time to recruit anybody for the signing day. At the end of the day, this was a decision that I think a lot of us can agree that Arthur Johnson in a lot of ways can't really mess up. Uh, this this is a really important decision. It's the first major decision he's making uh, as athletic director. So the timing of it all, I think, is just that he was keeping things very tight lipped, close to the vest, because he he really he didn't want anything to get leaked. He wanted things to to work the way he wanted. He wanted to make sure he was getting the right guy. So he was in no rush for any of this. Yeah. I think the other thing too, and I know this isn't what the question is here, but we talked about this in yesterday's podcast. There were some people, rightfully so, say, what, what is a search firm's role in this? And I kind of wanted to reemphasize this. If, if you knew if Arthur Johnson worked at Texas and Stan Drayton worked at Texas, and they talked about this earlier today, and Arthur acknowledged, like, I, you know, I knew him, but we weren't as close as people just would have normally assumed. Um, Why do you need a search firm to get Stan Drayton in here. Why did you take to, to tailor it more? This question, why did it take this long? Why do you hire a search firm? Why are you this thorough? Uh, a search firm, again, just to reiterate something I said yesterday, a search firm keeps things really tight and really streamlined and really confidential for the candidates on the outside. If they really want to kind of keep a low profile, they can get very streamlined, very focused, very direct questions asked. Hey, what is this, what is this program willing to pay? Where, um, what's the wiggle room there? Uh, it keeps things tight and it keeps things clean and it keeps things kind of anonymous for them. That's why you hire a search firm. Um, I, I get it. I get that the fans were patient. They wanted a decision. Uh, you know, how did the Fran stuff get out there? You know, was it leaked? What, did they really, really like Fran? Uh, all that stuff. Um, could it have been a situation where they got near the end and they maybe had this done two days ago and maybe Arthur says, hey, as uh, you know, being deferential to you, we'll wait until the signatures are in, so you guys don't lose anybody. Could be, I don't know, uh, but I, I agree with Arthur Johnson and that you know, yes, you did lose Makai Green to Monmouth. Not a great look. Would he have stayed if he knew two days ago about Stan Drake? And I truly don't know. But um, at the end of the day, I really think they were focused on you know getting it right as opposed to making the the super quick decision. And Arthur Johnson acknowledged that earlier today. So thank I want to thank everybody for their patience. Uh, so it could have been a signing day thing. I don't really truly truly know for sure. But an interesting question. Next question here. We got a couple more from Twitter. Actually, we have one that just came into me via text from my friend Pat Egan, who is. Uh, uh, of course, one of the uh, producer and one of the uh, parts of the morning show at 97.5, The Fanatic. Uh, I did a weekly hit with him uh, for, their webs uh, for their website every week this season. And I just texted this uh, to me for the scoop. Give me your best guess at Drayton staff, who would be some realistic home run hires, and give me your Christmas hot take. For example, mine is Christmas ornaments are not Christmas gifts. I like this one. You can always count on the... Uh, and uh, the addendum question from uh, from Pat Egan. So we'll go with this one. Give me your best guess at Drayton staff. Who will be some realistic home run hires? 
I'll take a stab at this. And again, I don't, I can't say that, you know, again, as we mentioned earlier, this becomes a little bit more interesting because he's not a head coach bringing in his own staff. If, if we're trying to take a stab at maybe who are some local guys that he might want to bring back with ties to this program that might make sense. I, I look first at maybe the, the Panthers roster. And I mean, this could get interesting because, you know, uh, you know, you, if, if Stan Drayton is talking to Matt Rule and he says, hey, Matt, um, you know, obviously I'm not going to get, you know, I'm not going to get Phil Snow off of your uh, Phil Snow off of your roster or your your new, you know, offensive coordinator off your roster. But, um, you know, a guy like Evan Cooper intrigues me, a former time. I mean, Evan Cooper seen a couple different uh, eras of the Temple rebuild. He played for Al Golden. He was a part of Matt Rule's staff. Um, you know, does a guy like, you know, if you're looking at like a Terrence Knight, who's a coaching assistant down there, uh, Rob Dvorak, who was a linebacker at Temple. And uh, well, there are a lot of people I've talked to who think that he has a bright future in coaching. I mean, he's just listed as a coaching assistant down there. I think of a couple of guys like that. I also think an intriguing name. And again, this is just me, Pat's asking us to take a stab. Kevin Gilbride, uh, who was here at Temple, a really well-respected guy. He's on Matt's staff now as a defensive analyst, but he was a, he was a wide receiver. He's coached on the offensive side of the ball. I think that's an intriguing name. Those are just a few names that I would, I would think of. Um, again, I think we were asked yesterday about whether or not Ed Foley would come back. Um, I think Ed would have to, it would have to be a pretty good situation. Ed feels like they've got a pretty good thing going on down there, even though the Panthers and their staff are facing a lot of scrutiny, but um you know, there are a lot of names I think that will pop up and you could say, okay, what about this? Chris Wiesenhan's another one to maybe keep an eye on. I, you know, um, Chris really liked being at Temple. I, he loved this area, loved living in Philly. His, his wife loved living in Philly. Again, we're just taking a stab here. If, um, if you know, if let's say if Stan Drayton says to Chris Wiesenhan, Chris, you've coached a lot of different positions. I want you to be my offensive coordinator or I want you to be my co-offensive coordinator and offensive line coach or co-offensive coordinator and tight ends coach. I think Chris Weezy hands here in a matter of days. That's just my opinion. Those are a few names that I would think of, but we can go around the horn on this in terms of just taking a shot in the dark at some other staff members. Dante, what are you thinking of? Yeah. The only name that I would like to throw in there is, uh, is Tim Beck, who is Texas's quarterback coach. I mm -hmm. spent my night listening to Stan Drayton press conferences and watching Stan mm -hmm. Drayton coaching clinics last night. Uh, and somebody asked him about Beck back when he was at Texas in 2017. Drayton spoke glowingly of him. And what I thought was interesting was when I was watching Drayton's coaching clinic, which I recommend every Temple fan watch on YouTube, you don't have to watch the X's and O's part. Just watch like the first 25 minutes where he talks more about like general football uh, philosophies. He talked a lot about well-rounded players uh, adapting schemes to fit players instead of adapting players to fit schemes. And I was listening to another press conference, 2017, somebody asked him about Tim Beck and he said, that's one of my favorite things about Tim Beck, right? So that you can already kind of see like the, the philosophical similarities. Obviously they have the Texas connection, just throwing a dart at a dartboard. I watched like four hours of Stan Drayton content last night. And that, that was like something that I came away with. I don't know how excited Temple fans would be about Tim Beck, the offensive coordinator, but just a name to keep in mind, maybe. You watched four hours of Stan Drayton content. We watched two or three hours of horrible basketball last I night. I did That's have the watched. horrible basketball on in the background. I had the horrible basketball on mute and Stan Drayton on, you know, on my laptop. So I, I was the, doing double duty, if you will. I actually do have a basketball mailbag question here that we'll get to. Uh, Sam, Javon, what do you have on this one? I would think uh, in terms of – who he brings in, it's uh, it, the amount that he said he's going to going to tap into Matt Rule and use him as a resource. I would think that, uh, and the amount that like how how much pressure and importance uh, I guess Arthur and others have put on having that connection to Temple on this staff. I would be hard pressed to believe there's not a Rule guy on uh, Stan Drayton's staff. Whether that's like we can get Ed Foley to come back to Temple or kind of someone in that realm. I don't have a bunch of names for you uh, off the top of my head, but I, I would, I would, again, I'd be hard pressed to believe there's not one or two uh, rule, uh, Matt Rule disciples on the staff. Yeah, I'd say Mike Sarafo is defensive coordinator. 
is a, a name that has to be, you know, out there. I get he's very close with Rule. He's his linebackers coach right now with Carolina. But you listen to Stan Drayton today, and his main thing about the identity of this football team is he wants them to be attacking. Uh, you know, an attacking football team has a physical and aggressive defense. And I know I, I look at those defenses Matt Rule had at Temple and at Baylor. Those were some nasty fronts. Uh, and Survivor has been a DB's coach, a linebacker's coach. And Drayton also wants guys who can recruit. Survivor has been a recruiting coordinator. So I think that needs to be, you know, as far as filling out the staff, next to Beck, I think Survivor needs to be one of those main targets. Like, hey, we need you back on North Broad. I want you running my defense. I want to turn this thing around. I think he's the guy. Uh, you know, I don't think he'll be like Jeff Noel staying at nickel and dime while your defense is getting ran over for 220 yards a game. So I think Saravo will be on that list. Any, just anything, honestly, would be better than Mike Grimovich and Jeff Noel. Cause that, that was just, that, that, that was hard to watch. I'm sorry. Woo! I mean, I Javon had a high school top coach. rope. Now, I had a high school jo- coach, the, the late Brooks, the, mm, the late Johnny Brooks. He had a playbook of 12, 12 plays. This then, those 12 Aberdeen high school plays were better than the 15 variations of the RPO and screen that I saw from Temple last year. And that's not even me sounding facetious. And like I said, I don't understand replacing linemen and linebackers with corners when you're giving up 220 yards per game as a defense. That made no sense. So just anything with a higher IQ than that, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure the fan base would be happy with. But I think Mike Saravo as defensive coordinator is the direction uh, Drayton should want to go in. I would love to see Javon. I don't see it happening for the, the simple fact that I think that Mike, uh, there were a lot of people who felt that Mike should have gotten an interview. And this is not me taking a shot at Stan Drayton whatsoever, but uh, I think Mike was worthy of an interview. I don't ultimately know if he got one or not, but uh, a, a couple of people who I know and trust very, very well told me that that Mike Saraba was offered the defensive coordinator position at Texas Tech, a seven-figure salary there, and turned it down. I don't know if, if he's coming to Temple, back to Philly. Does love it here, love the area. Um, he's from Rhode Island. And he's a BC guy, but loves this area of the country. Uh, I don't know that he was coming back unless it's for the head coaching position. I could also see you know, if, if Matt Rule gets some assurance that he's got it at least another year to get things figured out in Carolina, and if if Phil Snow were to say, hey, I'm retiring after this year, I think he's a guy that Matt might consider bumping up. Uh, I think he shadowed Phil a lot. Again, would love to see it. If Mike Saravo comes back as the defensive coordinator here, I think that's a huge pull, and I think that meant that that would mean that that took a lot of massaging and, and negotiating and networking with Matt Rule along that front. I would love to see it. I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's all that likely, but it's a, you know, good, good thought. I would say uh, because of the, the talent and that he has also an incredible recruiter as well. Um, uh, the next question, the last couple of questions here, these are coming from, uh, from Twitter uh, at Matt Deebs is the, the Twitter handle here. Any indication from the team on their first impressions of Stan It's very early, but he seems like an easy guy to get behind. Um, don't not, I mean, all, we're just reading body language at this point. They, you know, Cam Ruiz, Adam Klein, uh, Wisdom Course, you were there today, saw them smiling, saw them come over and, and hug them. And I would imagine, I, I do not know for sure. Again, we were not, we were not given the opportunity to talk to players today. So we should say that. I don't know. I mean, unless some of these guys were super ingrained on hoping that, that and again, the majority of this roster never played with uh, or for Fran Brown or Chris Wiesahan, unless some of these guys were like super dead set on a former Temple assistant getting the job, I would imagine that they like what they saw, but we really, really can't speak on their behalf unless you guys have heard anything trickle in over the last couple of hours. Yeah, I mean, I think all we know at this point is he's been in communication with his players. Uh, mm-hmm. I think he said something about talking to, to them again either tonight or tomorrow while we were walking out. But, yeah, like you said, there's nothing really there at this point except the fact that, uh, what, a handful of them showed up today? Yeah. I should. I'm so sorry to do this to you, Pat. I skipped over the second part of your question. I do not want to skip over the second part of your question, so we got to go back to it. 
give me your Christmas hot take. For example, mine is Christmas ornaments aren't Christmas gifts. Does anybody have any Christmas hot takes here? Is saying Christmas music is bad a hot take, or is that like I will fight I like, you for that? <laughs> I don't That's know. Funny. Okay, all right. Yeah, I don't like Christmas music. Never heard a Christmas song that I would like listen to. I like. I don't know. Like, uh, I live across the street from a uh, frat house in my apartment in North Philadelphia. They were bumping Mariah Carey at a darty right before I left, and like. Honestly, it was awful. It, I did, was not enjoying myself at all. I do not like Christmas music. I never had. I'm sorry. I don't know if that's a hot take or not, but like that's that's the first one that popped into my head. That's scorching hot. It, I, I, it, is that like that might have something to do with you being a, a warm weather kid, you know? So you can't really enjoy the full essence of Christmas. I, I, that that is a hot take, Dante. Uh, I mean, I guess I have one. I get killed for. Christmas music shouldn't start any earlier than Black Friday. I think, you know, just skipping over Thanksgiving is so disrespectful. I know there's no such thing as Thanksgiving songs, but let, let Thanksgiving have November and you can start the Christmas music the day after. Yeah, I've said that on this podcast many a time, so I will, I will back Javon. I, as someone who doesn't really celebrate Christmas, I, I don't feel... Like I'm in a position to give out, to just start spitting hot takes on Christmas. I don't really know. I kind of like, yes, you I kinda are. like I kind of like Christmas. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I have any, any harsh uh, or hot takes or any strong opinions. I, I enjoy Christmas. I don't have any qualms. Javon, but I do feel strongly as Javon said that uh, as someone who really thoroughly enjoys Thanksgiving, that uh, Christmas should be held off until after Thanksgiving. I, Javon, I love you with all my heart. I disagree with you. I don't think you're, I don't think you're insane for this opinion because a lot of people have scolded me over the years they've teased me i when november 1st comes around and like some of the like before and here i'm sounding old before you know spotify pandora before you could just pop on like music online and stuff like that and when some of the radio stations were starting to realize like here in philly like b101 oh this gets us ratings if like halloween's over now we're going to start to play christmas music was i the guy that was like starting to listen on november 1st to christmas music no I don't think it's insane to start listening to it maybe a week before Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving Eve is one of the most favorite nights of the year for me, not because I'm reconnecting with high school friends from, you know, 20 plus years ago. Uh, but I think it's, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to listen to it a few, a few days before, but you are certainly not alone in that opinion. I would be absolutely toned if, if, if I said that you were alone in that opinion, I thought it was unreasonable. It actually it might be it might be the worst thing in the world. Now that I think about it, it might actually be the worst. No, I'm just kidding. Jokes. No, it's jokes. Like, jokes. It's weird to go from goblins and ghouls to silver <laughs> bells, like in the span of two minutes. Like that that's great. That, that is, is great. you know, like that's somewhat <laughs> sick behavior. Like if you can change from that frame of mind, like you can go from this is thriller to the let it show <laughs> video from Boys to Men. I've got a few questions about your stability. Like, oh. I'm not judging you, but I know I've got to keep an eye on you if something goes down. That's all I'm saying. In the span of 30 seconds, Javon sang a bar from Silver Bells, and then he also did the thriller dance. You guys can't see it, but he, he nailed it. It was, it was pretty good. That was just I can't scoop. go from Vincent Price's menacing laugh at the end of that video to Nat King Cole soothing me over. Like, no, I need time to recover. I'm this is emotionally traumatized. This is the scoop on alscoop.com. That's that's a great drop right there. That was that was really good. Uh, mine might be, and I this is very talk radio-ish, and I know it sounds cliche, Pat, but um, a, a Christmas hot take. Uh, Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. I'm sorry. Love Die Hard. Tremendous movie. It's not a Christmas movie. Yes, it has some Christmas scenes in it, and this is this is fun to debate. You know, I, I, you know, there are some people who think that, uh, I don't know, Love Actually isn't a Christmas movie. I think Love Actually is very much a Christmas movie. The Holiday is a Christmas movie. Die, Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. It's a terrorism it's movie. It's, it's Bruce Willis fighting terrorists at Nakatomi Plaza in, in LA. It's, it's a movie about Bruce Willis fighting terrorism and reconciling his marriage more than anything else. It is not a Christmas movie. That's my... That's my hot take. 
I before I want to expand upon this because again we are approaching approaching the Christmas holiday. Give me your give me your top two Christmas songs if you have them. Dante probably won't care to answer this because he hates Christmas music. He also probably hates puppies and, and other cute heartfelt things. But if you Dante, if you do have a couple of favorite Christmas songs, you know, speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, he's just giving me this smarmy look like I'm gonna punch you, John. Sam has a couple. He's 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 doing the I want to make a point finger. No, no, no. I'm I'm doing the I don't know. I don't have much of an answer. Give me. Oh, well, that's the thing is that there's like six Christmas songs that are done over twelve times by different people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, that's my problem. And I worked retail in high school for four years. Well, that'll I, ruin it for you. Yeah. That'll no, ruin see, it. like Christmas music to me was like that was like an alarm of oh my god I'm gonna be busy for ten hours because everyone just comes to the store for Christmas, right? So like Christmas music for me was like an alarm to, oh my God, I'm going to want to die for the next 10 hours. So like that, like I, like it has been ingrained in me that Christmas music equals pain. It's it's like the it's like the Jeez. awkward conditioning like Christmas no, music like it has like it was man like it was it, I, I see where he's coming from because I, I do it hurt. just hurts every time I heard Christmas music the line was out the door I like you know it was <laughs> just not Christmas was not music good. Christmas music for Dante is like the opposite of the Sunday night football theme song like that just instills exactly. joy yeah, where well, hot music has, right here. brings it back to memories nope I don't want to hear it Javon no, don't no, say it. I don't want to know theme song don't even say it completely unnecessary it is it's we don't need it anymore. The, the you, you know, mean? the it's NBC like a, music is good enough. It's like the, 30 seconds. What are you uh, complaining the, about Carrie Underwood for like 30 it's, seconds? It's not necessary anymore. It's lost its appeal to me. But I see what you're saying about the Christmas music being triggering for you. Because when I hear, I can't stand Michael Bublé's voice, first of all. But whoa, when I hear, whoa. when I hear <laughs> his Christmas album, That's a I cool instantly thing. flash back to, oh my goodness, I've got to make 20 omelets right now. Used to work at IHOP. They played the <laughs> Christmas album so much. Christmas Day, Michael Bublé music. It just flashes me back to 20, 20 omelets. 20 Colorado omelets and 15 <laughs> big seeds, okay? And those awful chicken fajita omelets. Oh, they took 20 minutes to cook. Anyways, um, <laughs> who's, he, who's ordering a chicken fajita omelet at IHOP, man? You're at the a lot of people, Dante. Of, man, that's, <laughs> that's, that's rough, man. We had people ordering tilapia, Florentine, and T-Bone no, steel. Oh, no. Like, come on, man. Oh. Anyways, I hooked it up, though, because I can cook. Anyways, uh, <laughs> what was I going to say? Uh, number one, John, I agree. Die Hard is not a Christmas, mu- uh, Christmas movie. My mom's going to kill me if she hears this. Sorry, mother. Uh yeah, um, was like, oh number two, turkey also not needed on Christmas. Leave it for Thanksgiving. Uh, you yeah. can you can fry chicken for Christmas. Um, anyways, let's see top two Christmas songs. Goodness, uh, you're putting me on the spot here. You gave me your top five last week, but I want you to. I, I want the I want the people that the AlScoop.com scoop fan base to hear hear this because it, it, I, I thought you had some some good selections. Yeah. Okay. I got to reiterate it. Okay. So Silent Night by the Temptations, number one, uh, you know, like I, I told you in the, in your office, if Donnie Hathaway's uh, this Christmas isn't in the top 10, I lose my black card. If Silent Night <laughs> isn't in the top three, I really lose my black card. Uh, Temptations <laughs> happen to be my favorite group of all time. So yes, they get number one for that. And then number two, you know, I love Alexander O'Neill. My gift to you is great, but I discovered it later in life. Luther Vandross, love him so much. Me and my grandma share a special connection with Luther Vandross. So every year, every Christmas by him, go with the number two. Love the video too. Like you just feel, oh yeah. man, who broke Luther's heart? Why? He's sitting alone in the train <laughs> station in New York City. You know, like Luther, I feel your pain, my brother. I feel your pain. Oh, I love this. No, I that opening today. line too like i don't know why love would do this to me like you just yeah. know you're yeah. in for a painful song and you know what i'm not turning it off <laughs> i'm in for it luther soothe me over with your vocals while i suffer with you you know <laughs> oh it's tremendous stuff but see that's like that's like the emotional connection that it can create i, I talked to javon about this and for me it's like a tie between Percy Faith's version of Silver Bells, uh, anybody who is in their teens, 20s, 30s probably has no idea who Percy Faith is. He, you know, his orchestra and chorus, he did a lot of stuff with Johnny Mathis and stuff like this, but his version of Silver Bells, it was my grandfather's favorite song and therefore it became my father's favorite song. And I am trying to treasure every moment I have with, uh, with my father around the holidays. And so it became one of my favorite songs, tied between that and Nat King Cole's Christmas song. Um, 
love Donnie Hathaway's This Christmas. So, uh, but I will stop there because Dante's going to punch me in the face. And uh, maybe he won't punch me in the face, but he hates Christmas music. I, I think I'm going to say something to make him mad. Look, I'm not, a, I'm not uh, a Grinch. I just don't like Christmas music. I like Christmas. Do you like, have a little I dog named Max? Do you hate the people of Whoville? <laughs> I do not. No, the people of Whoville are, are perfectly fine. Um, I just, I just don't like Christmas music. I, I'm totally good with Christmas. I have a Charlie Brown tree out in the living room here in Florida. All right, like, I like Christmas, just don't like Christmas music. I, Javon, I mean, he's got I... a good point. Oh, go ahead, the, go ahead. Like, he's got a good point with the. There's so many unnecessary different renditions of songs, but I think like for Silver Bells, you got your version, and you got my version with Temptations. Like, I think mm-hmm. you only need two versions of each song. Give me the orchestra. And then give me, you know, Eddie Kendrick sending his notes, you know, city sidewalks, busy sidewalks, dressed in holiday style. You know, that's all I need. I mean, could Javon be having a better debut on the scoop? I don't know. Uh, we got, we got to so. get Javon on the and scoop. And we're not even often, done yet. Man. We're not done. We're not done yet. And he's, he has been a singer. He's been an artist. He's been yeah. a Temptations historian. Uh, I want to say one last thing before we move on to the last couple of questions, Dante. Your, the, the retail thing only holds so much weight for me. I worked at a Clemens supermarket from the time I was in 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, two or three years of college. I was a bagger. I was a cashier. I worked at this That's like, what I did too. crappy I did the thing that they had thing. called LA pizza, where you threw crappy pizza, like through this like little conveyor belt oven. I heard Christmas song after Christmas song, the Muzak, like elevator music versions. It did not, it did not scorn me like it scorned you so i only have just you're a stronger man than me john i I just simply (laughs) cannot compare to your ironclad will all right i just simply cannot i know what i'm being insulted i was i was broken as a young man (laughs) at at tanner's supermarket and customer after customer and silver bells in the background i just couldn't handle it as lucy said to charlie brown in the charlie brown christmas special i know when i'm being insulted We have to gather around Dante in this time of need. And now I, I now see this is a mental struggle for him. And I'm here to support him through this troubling time of year. <laughs> All I right. Pre- I um, appreciate you guys. Um, uh, and I think we got one last question here. I will double check Twitter, double check the message board. But uh, actually, this is <laughs> we're closing things out with a basketball question here. But I do not want to uh, ignore Dr. Drew's Twitter question here. Uh, but in the mailbag, saw a photo of the crowd Lee Force Center last night, and attendance looked terrible. Has attendance slash interest in Temple basketball ever been lower, or is this the worst it has ever been? Dr. Drew, I would agree with you. I, I will say that, you know, I think that the people are, have been slower to come back to games because of the pandemic, but, you know, I, we would be, you know, we would be insulting fans' intelligence if we, said that the the quality of basketball now again temple won its first two games after caleb battle got hurt against LaSalle, but you know the saint joe's game obviously that was at saint joe's uh, and then last night against ucf and the loss there that was to be honest with you and i'm not saying i think i i think i tweeted this last night that was the that was the lightest crowd that i have seen uh probably in in 10 years or so. Um, obviously that's just very, you know, loosely based there, but that was, they, they put what 3000 or something like that on the, on the final stat sheet. There were not 3000 people there last night. I honestly don't think there were more than 1100 or 1200 people in the building. Uh, I think part of it's the pandemic. I think part of it, every season that progresses where you're now 20 plus years removed from, a, a going past the first weekend of the NCAA tournament, there's just a little, another layer of scar tissue that builds up, but yeah, it was a bad crowd last night. And some people were saying, well, it's finals week. The students are home. <laughs> I, I, there was, I'm talking about the other sections where non-students could have been there. It was a bad crowd. So that was the worst crowd that I have seen in a long time. You did not, your eyes were not deceiving you there. All right. Well, that will do it for this week's bonus episode of the scoop. A uh, big thank you to Dante and Sam for hopping on and thrilled to have Javon with us for a, a, just a, just a tremendous debut on the scoop. He sang, he uh, just shared wisdom. He That was not my best singing impression, by the way. I mean, I will not give a full vocal performance. No, I, I have, 
I have stage fright. Okay. We're almost built in the day. You there know, you go. We've got, we've got some time. So uh, yeah, but uh, stay tuned to the site. We'll, we'll obviously have more coverage in the coming days and coming weeks as, as, uh, as things can continue to develop with, with Stan Drake and staff. Uh, so stay locked in there. And uh, thanks so much for tuning into us this week and listening to the scoop. If you haven't subscribed already, please do uh, drop us a rating and a review. The more ratings and reviews that we get, the more that you elevate the presence of Temple Sports Talk on those platforms. So uh, thrilled to have you guys following along and uh, thrilled to have some interesting news to report. So uh, like I said, stay locked into the site in these coming days and coming weeks, and we will talk to you soon. Have a wonderful weekend.